at last. And he threw himself down behind a fallen log a hundred feet away. He did not have to wait long. The cat was coming again to play with the mouse. The metaphor continues. Following the trail with the sureness of a bloodhound came General Zaroff. Nothing escaped those searching black eyes. No crushed blade of grass, no bent twig, no mark, no matter how faint in the moss. So intent was the Cossack on his stocking that he was upon the thing Rainsford had made before he saw it. His foot touched the protruding bow that was the trigger. Even as he touched it, the general sensed his danger and leaped back with the agility of an ape. But he was not quite quick enough. The dead tree, delicately adjusted to rest on the cut living one, crashed down and struck the general a glancing blow on the shoulder as it fell. But for his alertness, he must have been smashed beneath it. He staggered, but he did not fall, nor did he drop his revolver. He stood there, rubbing his injured shoulder, and Rainsford, uh, with fear again gripping his heart, personification, heard the general's mocking laugh ring through the jungle. Rainsford, called the general. If you are within sound of my voice, as I suppose you are, let me congratulate you. Not many men know how to make a Malay man-catcher. Lucky for me, I too have hunted in Malacca. You are prov proving interesting, Mr. Rainsford. I am going now to have my wound dressed. It is only a slight one, but I shall be back. I shall be back. When the general, nursing his bruised shoulder, had gone, Rainsford took up his flight again. It was a flight now, a desperate, hopeless flight that carried him on for some hours. Dusk came, then darkness, and still he pressed on. The ground grew softer under his moccasins. The vegetation grew ranker, denser. Insects bit him savagely. We're talking about the swamp here, right? Clearly, we, we were warned about the swamp as sort of a foreshadowing. Um, you can tell from the direction that he's running um, and, and the description of the surroundings that we're getting closer to this place. Then, as he stepped forward, his foot sank into ooze. He tried to wrench it back, but the muck sucked viciously at his foot, as if it were a giant leech, another simile. With a violent effort, he tore his foot loose. He knew where he was now, Death Swamp and its quicksand. His hands were tight closed, as if the nerve were seeking as if his nerve were something tangible that someone in the darkness was trying to tear from his grasp. He's afraid he's losing his nerve. He's losing his reason uh, in the fear. Uh, again, go back to the jaguar and make that connection throughout. The softness of the earth had given him an idea. He stepped back from the quicksand a dozen feet or so, and like some huge prehistoric beaver, he began to dig. All of these animalistic imagery um, moments associated with Rainsford. He's a human, but he's like a beaver. He's like a cat. He's like, he's like other animals um, doing things. And these similes, I think, are important because they connect him with the animals that he used to hunt. Um, Rainsford had dug himself in in France when a second delay, a second's delay meant death. That's a, a you know, reference to World War I in which Rainsford participated. It's also a hyperbole. Um, that had been a placid pastime compared to his digging now. The pit grew deeper. When it was above his shoulders, he climbed out and, for some, and from some hard saplings cut stakes and sharpened them to a fine point. These stakes he planted in the bottom of the pit with the points sticking up. With flying fingers, another hyperbole, he wove a rough carpet of weeds and branches and with it he covered the mouth of the pit. Then, wet with sweat and aching with tiredness, he crouched behind the stump of a lightning-charred tree. He knew his pursuer was coming. He heard the padding sound of feet on the soft earth, and the night breeze brought him the perfume of the general's cigarette. It seemed to Rainsford that the general was coming with unusual swiftness. He was not feeling his way along foot by foot. Rainsford, crouching there, could not see the general, nor could he see the pit. He lived a year in a minute. More hyperbole. They're all over the place. Then he felt an impulse to cry aloud with joy, for he heard the sharp crackle of the breaking branches as the cover of the pit gave way. He heard a sharp scream of pain as the pointed stakes found their mark. He leaped up from his place of concealment, then he cowered back. Three feet from the pit, a man was standing with an electric torch, that's a really old word for a flashlight, in his hand. You have done well, Orionsford, the voice of the general called. Your Burmese tiger pit has claimed one of my best dogs. Again you score, I think, Mr. Rainsford. I'll see what you can do against my whole pack. I am going home now to rest. Thank you for a most amusing evening. 
So again, more of this like playing with Rainsford, saving him for another night's entertainment. At daybreak, Rainsford, lying near the swamp, was awakened by a sound that made him know he had new things to learn about fear. I think that's an interesting line, too. He thinks he's understood fear. He understands what it means to be the hunted animal. But now he hears the dogs, and it's even worse than before. It was a distant sound, faint and wavering, but he knew it. It was the baying of a pack of hounds. Rainsford knew he could do one of two things. He could stay where he was and wait. That was suicide. Metaphor. He could flee. That was postponing the inevitable. For a moment he stood there thinking. An idea that held a wild chance came to him, and tightening his belt, he headed away from the swamp. The baying of the hounds drew nearer, then still nearer, nearer, ever nearer. We're increasing the tension. We're moving up to climax here, I think, pretty clearly. Um, let's see. I just lost my spot. Um, on a ridge, Rainsford climbed a tree. Down a water course, not a quarter of a mile away, he could see the brush moving. Straining his eyes, he saw the lean figure of General Zaroff just ahead of him, Rainsford made out another figure whose wide shoulders surged through all the jungle weeds. It was the giant Ivan, and he seemed pulled forward by some unseen force. Rainsford knew that Ivan must be holding the pack in leash. They would be on him any minute now. His mind worked frantically. He thought of a native trick he had learned in Uganda. He slid down the tree, caught hold of a springy young sapling, and to it he fastened his hunting knife with a blade pointing down the trail. With a bit of wild grapevine, he tied back the sapling. Then he ran for his life. The hounds raised their voices as they hit the fresh scent. Rainsford knew now how an animal at bay feels. That's an important line, too. Um, now he knows what it feels like to be the jaguar that he's hunting, what it feels like to be an animal. There's a sympathy in him that he completely lacked before. Go back to the beginning, and he had no sympathy for the animals at all. What did he say? Nonsense. This weather is making you soft. Wouldn't he be a realist? Um... He said, uh, I'm a big game hunter, not a philosopher. Who cares how a jaguar feels? You know, stuff like that. But now he knows how a jaguar feels. And I think this is important and thematic. Uh, he had to stop to get his breath. The baying of the hounds stopped abruptly and Rainsford's heart stopped too. They must have reached the knife. He shinnied excitedly up a tree and looked back. His pursuers had stopped. But the hope that was in Rainsford's brain when he climbed died for he saw in the shallow valley that General Zaroff was still on his feet, but Ivan was not. The knife, driven by the recoil of the springing tree, had not wholly failed. Rainsford had hardly tumbled to the ground when the pack took up the cry again. Nerve, 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 he panted. He's trying to keep his reason, right? As he dashed along, a blue gap showed between trees ahead. Even nearer, ever nearer drew the hounds. Rainsford forced himself on toward the gap. He reached it. It was the shore of the sea. Across the cove, he could see the gloomy gray stone of the chateau. Twenty feet below him, the sea rumbled and hissed. Rainsford hesitated. He heard the hounds. Then he leaped far out into the sea. When the general and his pack reached the place by the sea, the Cossack stopped. For some minutes, he stood regarding the blue-green expanse of water. He shrugged his shoulders. Then he sat down and took a drink of brandy from a silver flask, lit a cigarette, and hummed a bit for Madame Butterfly. That's an illusion. You can look it up. General Zaroff had an exceedingly good dinner in his great panel dining room hall that evening. Uh, with it, he had a bottle of Paul Roger and half a bottle of Chamber Chamberton. Two slight annoyances kept him from perfect enjoyment. One was the thought that it would be difficult to replace Ivan. The other was that his quarry had escaped him. Of course, the American hadn't played the game. So, thought the general, as he tasted his after-dinner liquor. In his library, he read to soothe himself from the works of Marcus Aurelius. He's a Roman emperor. You can, you can look him up, too. At ten, he went up to his bedroom. He was deliciously tired. That's an interesting combination of words. He was deliciously tired, he said to himself, as he locked himself in. There was a little moonlight, so before turning on his light, he went to the window and looked down in the courtyard. He could see the great hounds, and he called, Better luck another time, to them. Then he switched on the light. A man, who had been hiding in the curtains of the bed, was standing there. Rainsford, screamed the general. How in God's name did you get here? I swam, said Rainsford. I found it quicker than walking through the jungle. The general sucked his breath and smiled. I congratulate you, he said. You have won the game. Rainsford did not smile. I am still a beast at bay, he said in a low, hoarse voice. Get ready, General Zaroff. The general made one of his deepest bows. I see, he said. Splendid. 
One of us is to furnish a repast for the hounds. The other will sleep in this very excellent bed. On guard, Rainsford. He had never slept in a better bed, Rainsford decided. What a great ending. That's the last line. So we know Rainsford won. He defeats General Zara. He wins by ceasing to be the hunted hunted and becoming the hunter. That's how he turns the tables on Zaroff. He goes back to Zaroff's chateau when the dogs aren't there to protect it, climbs up to the bedroom and waits there um, like an ambush predator for Zaroff to return and then gets him. And uh, so that's how the story ends. Now there's a lot of commonalities here uh, that we can talk about in terms of how this relates to the Hunger Games, maybe how it relates to um, the Cyclops story and the Odyssey. Uh, we can talk about themes and, and what's going on there. We can talk about dynamic characters, but that's what all your paragraphs are about. So I'm going to leave that for the next video that I'll record tomorrow or the next day and, and get up online um, shortly. But I want you to think about all those things. What is Connell doing? I mean, the important part about studying literature in ninth grade is to make that shift when you're stopping thinking about, you know, just what the plot of the story is or, you know, what, you know, something may represent in a symbolic way. That's interesting. But think about the intent behind it. We can't know what Connell's intent was. I mean, that's that's literally impossible uh, because he's not here to tell us. But we can think about the effect that the... Um, you know, the choices the author makes in the way the story is told have on the reader. And we can think about uh, how it is designed to make us consider certain things, like what's the difference between hunting and murder? You know, this is a question that we should ask. Uh, what's the value of human life? Why do human lives have value and animal lives not? Uh, you know, we've got all of these sorts of questions that Connell is bringing up and discussing, and he doesn't give us answers. Those answers aren't there, but he lets us think about them, and he implies certain things. I mean, you want to think about what he implies and why, why he implies it and how he utilizes things like symbolism and character development and Rainsford's dynamic character shift to teach us elements uh, throughout the story, and that's what we make our argument about. Every paragraph we write is an argument. It is not fact. It is us making suppositions as readers and trying to prove those suppositions through quotation and analysis. And that's what I'm asking you to do for your paragraph. So I'm going to stop here and uh, I'm going to upload these and, and send them out to you. I hope you're all still doing well uh, and hanging in there. And I will be back with uh, some more analysis of this next time. See ya.